This is my Final Fantasy XIV Iron Man. The challenge is simple. Get as far as I can in Final Fantasy XIV by myself. No parties with other players or NPCs, no market board, no retainers, and minimal NPC shops. For as long as it's still possible, I'll have to use level sync and do the dungeon solo on level. You may have noticed at the end of the last video that I'm now sitting pretty at over a million gil. Dynamis and the Oceanic server have a bonus running where if you get a character to level 30, they just give you a million gil. Day 1 starts with finishing the Marauder quests. The Warrior class upgrade won't be relevant for a while since I had to progress the MSQ before I can unlock it. And it's even less relevant since the next dungeons are below level 30, but it's nice to eat the frog and get the annoying side quests out of the way. Speaking of side quests, I throw in another small detour to get Duo to eat his veggies and unlock some extra storage space. Since I can't use retainers, this is all the storage I'll ever have. My four pages of inventory and Duo's saddlebag. Not like I ever really used retainer storage for anything anyway. Skipping through the long MSQ grind, we make it to the next dungeon, the Thousand Maws of Toto Rock, our first attempt at a level synced dungeon. This was going to be much more difficult than the last three, and I was excited for the challenge. In fact, I was so excited that I just jumped into the dungeon without upgrading my gear at all. Each pull was its own trial. Mitigation management, learning which enemies to prioritize, it even got so bad that I had to start using the Palace of the Dead solo strat and run away while range tomahawking to delay for potion cooldown. After a solid seven minutes for clearing the trash mobs, it was time for the first boss. Stuns would still work for mitigation, but it wouldn't help much. The main problem was poison. The Ninetales keeps constant uptime on its poison debuff, which can't be assumed. And to my dismay, this also meant I couldn't use antidotes. And antidote doesn't work because it's a non assumable poison. Okay. What the hell is the point of antidote? With damage stacking up and its autos hitting hard, I was constantly on the back foot. When I got too low, the only option I had was to sprint and tomahawk to hold out for my next potion. Then, keeping out of range for its autos, I managed to just barely scrape by and take it down. The rest of the dungeon was honestly much worse in terms of trash mobs. Warden's whip threw out dozens of poisons, and the big mushroom men had a hard hitting instant cast. After many more struggles and practically running back to the start of the dungeon, I was at the second boss. Another nine tails, but this time, one that would summon adds. With the extra poison from adds, it was a much more resource intensive fight, and in the end, I lost due to my lack of potions. My gear needed an upgrade to help deal with the trash mobs, I needed more potions to survive the whole run, and I needed to stop procrastinating making accessories. After mining some more to spam brass ingots for levels, I took a quick pit stop to unlock melting. It may not be the most helpful for the dungeons, but it would be a great boost for my gatherers and crafters without having to make new gear. Next up is grabbing some silver to finish off my new accessories with one little problem. The best wrist I could make was a coral armalay. White coral needed fishing, and to be perfectly honest, I still had no idea how to fish. I mean, even on my main, all I did was deep sea fishing and never any real fishing for crafts. So I went to the spot with a fishing hole for white coral, hopeful I could grab some with my crayfish ball bait. Nothing. Okay, what do white coral want for bait? Seems like they want goby balls, and also I was at the entirely wrong area to fish for white coral, okay. Oh no, I can craft goby balls. Uh, well, so long as it's the same as before and I need goby balls to catch goby for the go- Oh. Uh, no, okay, it needs crayfish ball bait, I have to craft it. Now I need to find where gobies spawn, shave a few years off my life to get three of them, craft the bait, and it's time to catch some coral. Except that for the ten goby ball bait I got, I only caught one coral. Haha, <laughs> wow, what a great catch, subscribe! Gobies again, I guess. And now I'll get the coral, right? Actually, yes. Thank god, I would have lost it otherwise. Yes! Yes! Thank god. <laughs> I hate fishing. So now I had all my accessories and a bit of extra experience for my culinarian. Next, it was time to upgrade my armor. The next tier of equipment used a new metal, steel. For steel, I'd need bomb ash along with my iron ore, and no matter how many balloons I killed, they refused to drop it, so I've gotta grind up my miner. 
I spent some time filling out my gathering log to level up, and at level 24 I took a quick break to upgrade my crafter and gatherer gear as I was really struggling to keep up. While getting a new needle for my weaver, I leveled my goldsmith and found some incredible new accessory options. Starting with a quick upgrade to my weaver offhand, we had a lot to get done. Dodos for animal hide, and animal hide to hard leather to get us a new helmet and chest for my gatherers. New pants for my crafters, I grabbed some elm lumber, made a new pickaxe, and a few silver or later it was time to get bomb ash. I remembered for once to get the aetherites I went past, so little Alamigo was added to the list. With bomb ash in hand and the Forgotten Springs aetherite obtained, it was time to craft some steel. Before making the armor, we grabbed some yew lumber for some last minute gear upgrades. And then everything falls into place. A shiny new helmet and chest plate, and an entire array of Sphene accessories. The armor and accessory grinds were done. After quickly unlocking Warrior, some last minute potion crafts, and a few melds, it was the end of day one. Day two starts bright and early. After all of my preparations last night, it was time to give Todorok another attempt. Trash mobs were still scary, and I got a bit careless at times, but overall I could feel the difference in gear. The first Nine Tails was a much cleaner fight, so much so that I didn't have to run to pad for potion cooldown until the very end. With the first boss down, the real test was coming up. Had all of this been enough to handle the second boss's ad phase? Just barely. The rest of the fight was much easier, and so all that was left was the final boss. I had gotten pretty lucky on gear drop so far, so I threw on some new pants before starting. It was finally time to face the spider... Scorpion... Duh... Wait, what is this thing? Graphius has another ad phase, but thankfully they don't poison, so I just had to focus them down and keep healing. And once Tail was targetable, taking it down gave me plenty of time to get healed back up and extra damage on the boss. And with that, we've got a level sync total rock clear. And after a quick glamour that I forgot to record, Bill was back to looking like his old self. Gorgeous. Back to the MSQ grind, I'll spare you the scenes of me skipping cutscenes and give you this instead. It's gotta drop something good, right, if it takes this long to kill? Just 162 experience, I got four Peist skins from the normal Peist, but that one just couldn't even give me like some Peist skins. Next up is Hawk Manor, but not without another round of walnut bread. Riding the high of Todorok, I figured I'd give Hawk Manor a shot before making any new gear. The trash mob fights were miserably slow because of my low damage, so it was time to use my favorite strat. First, we'll have to talk about mobs. A lot of you may already know this, but just bear with me for the ones that don't. Mobs have three possible forms of aggression. Sight, where they only aggro if you go in front of them. Sound, where they aggro if you go near them at a normal speed and true aggro, where they target you when you enter a certain area around them. For a majority of these earlier dungeons, while you might assume the mobs have true aggro, they actually only have sound aggro. With slow walk on and waiting for a good movement cycle, I can sneak right past them. Normally, people only care about these aggro types for soloing Palace of the Dead or Heaven on High, but we're going to be making use of them in our dungeon runs going forward. Alright, lesson's over, time for the first boss. With some well-timed interrupts and stuns, this was more of an endurance test than a boss fight, at a total of three minutes. For the basement, I decided to really take my time and avoid fights. I snuck past almost every mob and only had one fight before the boss. Since there were two bosses, I would have to constantly swap aggro to manage stun up time, but after the imp went down, it was smooth sailing. With the second boss down, I was feeling unstoppable, but a bit worried for final boss. The old Hawk Manor had you managing four torches and constant AoE hits. I could barely remember what the new boss did, so I was racking my brain for how to handle torch damage. Thankfully, my worries ended up being for nothing, and the new mechanics were one maid servant spawn to kill and face away after seduction. With plenty of cast times to heal during, the boss went down and Hawk Manor was complete. Hey, we're leveled up. Okay. Oh, well, 32 minutes. They didn't give me sw wait. Swift completion bonus for a 32 minute dungeon. Are you crazy? I had barely managed to scrape by for these last two dungeons. It was getting pretty obvious that if I wasn't at max stats for each instance, I'd be struggling. So before we went back on the MSQ grind, it was time to craft. First was grinding leather worker from level 16 to 28. The alt goat population is in shambles, but I can now make toad leather. 
And a few big frogs later, we've got the toad leather to technically make new gear, but I needed some upgrades to guarantee high quality. That was a task for later though. For now, I leveled my botanist, grabbed some oak logs, and fell asleep. Day 3 starts with a playtime check. We're now sitting pretty at 26 hours with a lot of crafting grind to come. Leatherworker upgrades, bane mites for webs, leveling leatherworker and some new gatherer shoes, boar leather unlocked, carpenter levels for oak lumber, new weaver offhand, new saw for my carpenter, struggling to make oak lumber, a new hatchet for my botanist, wild hogs for boar hide, new crafter chest and shiny new crafter hat, some quick last minute melds, and one more tool upgrade. Now with all that, high quality boar leather is within reach. Great, we've got one of the mats for the armor now. At least it was the hardest mat. But before I can craft the armor, I'm out of shards, so I need to go gather some ice shards. Shards obtained, it's time for the armor. Just like last time, it's a pant boot combo, gloves, and a head chest combo. Oh, and better stats for Bill. After that was some more crafter and gatherer upgrades, but I needed fish glue for some, and so we're back to the MSQ. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about, baby! Hit rock with axe, let's go! Now, it was time for the hardest dungeon yet. Brayflox, long stop. Hawk Manor was slow, but manageable, but Toto Rock was ad-centric and much more viable to kill me. Brayflox is also ad-centric with some of the hardest hitting mobs yet, and four bosses to get through. Even trash mob pulls of three were getting difficult. Fights were slow and mobs hit hard, leaving no room for missed mitigation. And of course, after the adds was the first boss, the Great Yellow Pelican. The boss's auto attacks were hitting for 150, just barely less than Storm's Path healed me, and he had an instant cast, Hammerbeak, that hit for more than 200. The fight starts with three Violet backs, each individually applying a poison debuff. And to make things even worse, he summons more adds throughout the fight. The first group can be either three more violet backs or two violet backs and a saber back. Saber backs are good, but I still need to burst the violets quickly. The first attempt was a complete wall. It seemed like it wasn't even close to possible, but I ran in for another attempt. Dead again, but I got a bit further this time. The thing holding me back right now was my potions and learning the boss. While I was cooking up a plan, I ran over to the Sapphire Avenue for Dark Matter to repair my gear, and it was time to grind for potions. It should be easy, right? The next potion should probably be pretty close to high potions, right? No, of course not. What are you, crazy? Alright, let's distract ourselves with a weapon upgrade. So with a massive grind ahead of me, and barely any shards to do it with, it was time for levy quests. For the few who don't know, levy quests are quests you can take on your crafters and gatherers that give lots of experience. You're limited by your levy quest allowance and regen 3 allowances every day. Since you can only do a limited amount, you have to be efficient with them. The most important thing to note is the card at the top right of the quest. For the earlier quests, level 1 to 60, this card with a grandma means you can turn in the quest three times per allowance. So really, you get three times the XP. Combine that with two times XP for handing in high quality, and you're getting a level every turn in. I went on a quick trip to kill ants for acid, and morbles for morble vines to make a special potion for the levy quest, but we'll talk more on that one later. Moving on though, I had mega potions unlocked, which was great, except it required high level botanist materials. After spending the next hour grinding flax and oak logs, I needed an upgrade before moving to the next items. A quick trip to the desert later and we've got a new hatchet and scythe. Even after all that grinding, only one of the materials for the mega potions was available, so to try and avoid another botanist grind, I jumped back into Brayflox for another attempt with plenty of high potions. The potion needed for the earlier levy quest was a poisoning potion. This potion has a separate cooldown to healing potions and would inflict a 15 second poison on my target. And it worked on bosses. The damage from these was significant. I was hopeful that the extra DPS would make it more feasible. I gave it a few attempts, with my best run getting to 54%, but there was no getting around it. I needed the better potions. And so, I grinded Mugwarts until 40. Mugwarts collected for the potions, the last mat was Mistletoe over in Coerthus. 
After grabbing the Dragon Head Aetherite, I collected some Mistletoe before heading down to get Mordona's Aetherite as well. The Mega Potions were done, so it was time to hit the hay and end Day 3. My arm, my hand is going through my head. I start off Day 4 with some new ideas that fell through, but at least we have new Alchemist gear out of it. The last thing before jumping back into Brayflox is new food. After leveling my culinarian, I end up going with some pretzels. And it was once again time to visit my old friend, the Great Yellow Pelican. The potions healed for almost double my old ones, so the fight went a lot better. After a few close calls, I finally managed to take it down after fighting for seven minutes straight. Yes! Yes! I hope you didn't think that was the hard part. Next up is the Inferno Drake the hardest hitting mob to date, with each auto attack dealing around 250 damage. If that wasn't bad enough, at 80%, Brayflox himself runs in with an ad trailing behind and forces its aggro on you. If you run too fast and Brayflox isn't able to provoke the ad, it'll hit you with an undodgeable AoE that paralyzes. If you manage to kill the ad, the fight gets a lot easier, except that Brayflox will try and kill you constantly. He gives the boss a debuff that puts aggro on him and then runs next to the player for an instant cast Conal AoE and loses aggro. My third attempt went well, getting the boss to 16%, but I died from Brayflock sabotage and with practically no potions left I had to give up this run. One long mistletoe grind later and we were restocked on mega potions. Just to make sure that I had the best possible chance, I did a levy quest for my goldsmith and made some new Heliodor accessories. This was full stat cap for Brayflock's long stop, without question. All that mattered now was getting to the last two bosses. The first attempt at the Great Pelican had an extra ad wave of three violet backs, so yeah, we didn't, we didn't live that one. The second attempt had much better spawns, so we're on to the Inferno Drake. Now that I knew to run in circles whenever Brayflox had aggro, the Drake went down in one try. Yes, dude! Yes! 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 Okay. We made use of our sneak strats for Hawk Manor, and it was on to the third boss. Hellbender is both the easiest and the scariest boss for a solo. Almost every attack is a cast, so you get plenty of time for potion cooldowns, but he can throw a conal AoE at you while you're stuck in the bubble. If you aren't fast at killing the bubble, or stun him out of the AoE, it'll be big damage. And then, at 20%, the final boss swoops in and kills Hellbender. You'll have to get him to below 75% for him to leave and the boss fight to end. And with that, Hellbender's done first try. Only one fight left, and going off of the last bit of Hellbender's fight, it seems like this was going to be easy. After dodging a few more mobs, we're at the end. If I run out of potions trying this, or the instance timer runs out, I have to start over again from the Great Yellow Pelican. This boss was by far the easiest. Everything is a cast, he rarely autos, and I had more than enough health. After all of the hard work that went into getting here, this felt like a deserved reward. Oh, what a godsend. Brayflux finished, man. Wow, how many attempts was that? What? That was so good. I'm so happy. This was such a good run to end it on. Swift completion? Swift completion. Yeah? Yeah, really? Yeah. Okay. Swift completion, baby. <laughs> 41 minutes on the dot. What the hell is swift completion? There is no feasible way that an actual party of people would ever not get swift completion. Oh, I'm, I'm really... I'm on cloud nine. This has been the whole day <laughs> trying to get Brave Locks done. I'm so happy. Oh, wow. Okay, what's playtime? Playtime to, <laughs> to finish Brave Locks is, um, I think that's 38 hours. Yeah, so that, that took a bit. And with that, we're finished another major milestone. We've got some rocky roads on the horizon, but that just makes it all the more exciting. This next task will be our biggest grind yet. And I'll see you there. Wow, you're still watching? 
maybe, maybe uh, subscribe then, or, you know, comment or something. I don't know, man, I'm just the end screen.